Hello, everyone. My name is Elisa Ewan, and I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations at Teachers College. Thank you for joining us today for our last Alumni Career Development Webinar for 2020, which is co-sponsored by TC Next and the Alumni Relations Office. It covers a range of career-related topics and features speakers from a variety of industries. This is one of the many ways you can stay engaged with your TC family. I'd like to quickly remind you of a few more ways you can maintain a meaningful connection with Teachers College. One, hire TC students and alumni. Two, refer prospective students to the college. Three, showed your pride by including Teachers College in all of your professional credentials. Four, share your talents and expertise by volunteering to speak at TC events or joining one of our alumni association committees. And last but not least, when the time is right for you, please support TC financially by donating to the TC fund. We are especially grateful for the TC alumni who share their knowledge through insightful presentations like the one we're about to hear today for all of the TC community to learn together. And now I would like to introduce today's event presenter, alumna Erin Hilgart, who will be presenting Rethinking Organizational Change Management in 2020. Dr. Erin Hilgart is the principal of Hilgart a leadership strategy and organizational development firm in New York City. As an expert change consultant, certified executive coach, and thought partner to leadership teams, Erin brings a holistic approach to helping great leaders build great companies. From working with leaders to envision the future of their organization, to coaching them to have the skills needed to embark on that visionary path, to assessing the reality of organizational current culture and developing the learning programs and policies that will better engage employees, Erin considers the full scope of a company and its people. Erin and her team forge true partnerships with clients and develop leaders to be the drivers of change rather than doing the change for them. Prior to founding Hilgart in 2010, Erin held global leadership and change management roles in London and in Singapore. Erin's research combined with her years of experience partnering with organizations during times of organizational change informs her approach to helping companies prepare for the future of work. Erin holds an EDD in adult learning and leadership and an MA in organizational psychology from Teachers College Columbia University. She'll be taking questions from the audience during the latter part of our event, so feel free to drop in your questions in the Q&A located at the bottom of your screen. She also provided a handout for today's workshop, so please make sure you have that ready. The link to the handout will be in the chat. Just want to let you know that we'll also be utilizing the chat and the polling feature during our workshop today, and both of those are located at the bottom of your screen. If you have any technical or audio issues, please feel free to chat and let us know how we can help. And without further ado, here's Erin. Hi, thank you so much, Elisa, for that introduction. Uh, as you know, this is one of my favorite topics and I could talk about it all day long. So it's great to be here talking about it in 2020. Um, as we get started here, I'm, I'm grateful for the people in the chat who are, are who are chiming in. Hi, Thomas in Frankfurt, and there's someone here from Swansea, so keep that coming. It will help me to keep what I'm talking about relevant to what uh, to what you're here to, to to talk about today. So when we think about organizational change, I always think it's important with anything that we do like this to think about what motivates us to talk about this topic. So I guess this is a combination of me kind of coming clean with what my motivations are combined with kind of finding out from you where, where you're coming from when you're thinking about change. So for me, organizational change management is the thing that I will choose sort of every single time over other types of leadership or learning or kind of broader OD work because it's always filled with that sense of possibility. It's really that time when in an organization where there is enough commitment from enough stakeholders and there's really a true platform and the hope of doing something greater. 
Um, it's also quite frankly, I like it because it's the opposite of it is what it is. I think as much as we hear the word change in organizations, probably almost as often we hear it is what it is. You kind of got to get on with it. And that always make that always throughout my career kind of made me cringe. So this is a chance to work on things that are really about the future and making things the way we want them to be rather than the way that they necessarily are. Um, I think it's also when the current state for whatever reason is not sustainable. It might not be profitable, it might not be ideal. In 2020, it's sort of organizations don't even have the choice. It's because the world has sort of changed. So it means that we're in a time where real transformation is possible. It's also a time when there is a possibility that organizations goals and people's purpose can align. And that's very exciting to me because you see many or you see many situations where that's not the case. And it doesn't always happen with change, but there's always that possibility. And I always work hard to see uh, where I can help to make that alignment. And then last but not least, I honestly like the messiness and the complexity of change. And so that that attracts me to it. So I'd love to hear from other people as you are as you are joining. What is it that motivates you to work in change management if you do work in change management? Or even if it was just interesting enough to spend a whole hour out of your busy day, if you don't mind sharing that in the chat, I will, I'd love to hear that. Okay, so far people are excited. So that sounds good. I'll 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 wait for more. Um, so if you can keep that coming, um, and as well as I'd like to hear from people on the chat about your, just if you could share your industry and job role, you don't have to get too specific, but just kind of so we generally know what types of professions and what types of industries we have here. And then a change management topic that's top of mind in your organization, or if there isn't one in your organization, one that's top of mind for you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna look for that. We've got public sector. We've got change and communications consultant, financial services. Great, helping people, diversity and inclusion, absolutely, that's a big one. Mergers, digital transformation, FinTech, org development, HR. Great, so keep that coming. So yes, I think it's all of these, all of these of course are a part of that broader change landscape. So I'll do my best. Oh, Wendy's there, technology, HR business partner, change and strategy. Definitely seeing a lot of that in 2020. So if I give an overview here about what we're gonna do um, and then I will make sure that I tailor it to the questions that are coming in. So first of all, we'll start with how usually we do change management in organizations and how it happened a bit differently during the pandemic. And I really wanna hear about your experience of change to the extent that it's possible in this, this webinar environment. Then I'm gonna take out an old lens of looking at change, organic versus mechanistic change, and look at that sort of differently now that we've had this pandemic experience and link that to what lessons can we take away from the pandemic experience? How does that sort of inform then how we do change management going forward? and how that might impact your role in creating change in the future. So that is our agenda for today. So I'd like to hear from people in the poll. Uh, so this should pop up on the screen here. So hopefully you can see that. So there's four choices and I know there's probably many other reasons, but if you can try to pick the one that fits you best, the first one is you are actually a change management or change leadership person. You have some sort of role with change and you can influence your organization. So that might be a leader, a change person, a talent, an OD person, an HR person, an executive, any of those in that bucket. So if you fall in that bucket, if you wanna tick that box, the next option is you don't have any of those responsibilities sort of organizational wide, but you are a leader or manager who can influence your own team. So we'd like to see if we have some of those people here. And you don't have, the third one is you don't have responsibility for either of these things. You're not an org change person and you don't have your own team, but you are interested in influencing change. I think some of the best change work is done from individual contributors. So if you can tick that box, if that's you. And then I put a fourth box, if you're curious sort of for any other reason, maybe we have some current students attending that aren't working right now, uh, any reason that you're, that you're curious. Uh, so if you just wanna go ahead and submit, We'll just take another minute to see those come in. Oh, and I see some people from my alma mater, undergrad alma mater over in college are there. Great to see you here. People are strategic change partners. So I'm gonna give it another few seconds for the poll and then we can see the results.
Okay. All right. So almost half of you have a change management or change leadership role of some kind and can influence across the org. Um, and then another nearly quarter of you are a manager of some kind, 17%. And then another quarter don't have a responsibility for change, but you do want to influence. And then we've got a few other curious people. So I think that sounds like a great breakdown. So I am going to tailor my messaging a lot to each of those things. I try to start really with the organization level because this is sort of a systemic uh, discussion. And then I will also have some specific uh, discussion for managers and individual contributors as well. So thank you for sharing that, that's helpful. So when you think of change management, what comes to mind? So I'd love to just, again, see in the chat what comes to mind for you. And I'll obviously share some things on the screen as well. Complexity, that's a great one. That's a good organic change topic. Culture, definitely. Okay, so things that are new and different, rethinking how to get work done. So I laid out a bunch of different change topics here that I think, uh, and the list goes kind of on and on, but it's, it's really everything from the physical to the operational, to the human part of it, to the human capital part of it, to org charts, creating value, the transition we all go through, the resistance that we face. And so when I talk about change management, I am talking about all these things, but I'll put the caveat that I'm talking about it from the angle of what is worthy of bringing home to your family and talking about at dinner, to your best friend when you have a drink on Zoom. There's not many times where somebody gets a new org chart and they print out a copy and they take it home and they say, oh, I, we have a new organizational structure to their spouse. And they say, uh, Here, here's your copy. That's not how that conversation goes. It usually goes, oh, there was an announcement today and I'm not sure what it means for me. Or this means that I think I'm gonna lose part of my most influential work and I'm not sure what to do about it. Or I see this as an opportunity, but there's certain actions I should take. So it's really that part that is personal for people that people take home. That's, that's the part that I'm really focused on, really around what does this really mean for the people who it's affecting? And obviously we have some very specific changes coming up with the future of work. If you've been reading any of the articles, the top three here, automation, remote working, digital and technology advancements are kind of the things that are predicted in 2021 to change the future workplace. Also related closely to that are the following two, kind of the experience and skill gaps. On one hand, there's people losing their jobs and are underemployed or not employed. And on the other hand, we definitely see reports from all the major consulting firms that uh, executives are concerned about skill gaps uh, now and into the future. And there's also this re-energized focus on equity and really making that a systemic thing that it's not just a, a couple of good programs, but that it's really built into the culture and that succession plans pay attention. You, you'll be, you've been seeing, I'm sure the articles about really the impact the pandemic has had on women or minorities in the workplace and how organizations really need to to make sure they, they course correct for that. So all of these big changes are coming up and I see other people typing in sustainability, perseverance, opportunities, adaptation, all great, I think, change concepts as we move forward. So where I'm coming from with all this is how do people successfully shift? And I like the word shift because it's only one syllable, yet it means a lot of different things. There's definitely the skill set in there. We hear about skill sets a lot. But it's also very closely aligned to mindset. What mindset are people bringing into the future of work, into the way things are changing? And also, how is their identity affected? So how do I see myself differently with the way that my company is deciding to organize me or the greater formality or less formality of my role during this time? So I think all of these things come into question. And this has been the backdrop of my research, but it's also been the question that I sit and think about during the past 10 years in my consulting business and, and definitely far before that in working in change management for the past 15 years or so. So that's really where my focus is. And I'm going to ask you the same question, really in the pandemic context, to think about what have you changed or learned or accomplished during the pandemic in these last nine months? So a very simple thing. So if you didn't print it out, I know most of us don't, I might suggest just taking a blank piece of paper. Our minds kind of open up when we have blank paper, take a marker, I've got a Sharpie here and just kind of write some of the ideas, some of the milestones. 
Uh, and some, for some of you, this might be something very specific. So I do this with coaching clients and it can be a very, you never know what's gonna come out of it and sort of an hour long conversation around it. But sometimes it starts with very tangible things. Oh, I, I got into a fitness routine that I wasn't able to do before because I could just go on a, a Zoom class or whatever. It was virtual. I didn't have to drive to the gym. And then maybe I fell off, fell off of that for a while and got back on it. So it could be a very tangible thing like that. It can also be around personal things. It can be around changes in your work. Maybe you've been able to balance having doing your homeschooling with your children next to you while you work and you're doing things differently. And it may not be a perfect story, but it's your story. And it's the story from the last nine months. So if you can capture that here, and perhaps as we go, and as I'm talking about organizational change more broadly, we'll be able to have a chance to relate this at the end. And then a really key question along the bottom, as you think about each of the things that you accomplished, think about what actually influenced you as you, as you went. So were there certain people? Was there things that your organization did? How did what's happening in the world, the societal shifts, the politics, uh, anti-racism, Black Lives Matter, anything that was happening in your life, family dynamics, perhaps loss that you dealt with. And really just think about all the interactions between those influences and everything you accomplished. It's a lot. Um, so I'll leave that with you to sort of perhaps pencil and, and work on as we go through the rest of my presentation. So now let me go back out away from you and go to the change management topic, how we do change management in organizations. So here on the left, I have an oversimplified picture of what I see as a lot of the traditional change management models that we use in organizations. And this isn't meant to be a model in itself, but I've tried to just summarize the highest level themes that we tend to see when we're leading change. So you might have your own model that you use. The Cotter model is a common one uh, that, that, that's used in a lot of organizations, but it really starts with this vision from the top that there's somebody or a group of people who have a clear enough vision and we get together and we say, this is important. We're gonna put, we're gonna have some backing behind it. We then engage the right senior leadership in driving that change. That can be the board, that can be the, the CEO, the CFO, the whoever is responsible in that particular division or the company as a whole. And then at some point we get around to saying, okay, now we've got this in Cotter language, we've got this driving coalition, we've got the right people around the table. And so now we're gonna drive that change down the organization and we're gonna close skill gaps. We're gonna get people on board. We're gonna have a great comms plan. And at some point, this hope is that the change is complete, that we will achieve. And I've got the tick boxes there. I sometimes even see that in organizations, right? We like to tick our way along the way. We follow sort of a, a project management methodology when we approach change. Now, there's a few of you on the call that may be exceptions to this, especially because this is at TC. So I know there's a couple of students and I believe one graduate in adult learning and leadership who are doing their dissertations on self-managed work teams. So if you're in an organization that's really embracing this idea of work not being something that comes from the top and gets delegated down and change following suit, you might do things very differently. But for most of us, certainly for almost 99.9% you know, .9 of the work I do, this is the model that's followed. And then over here on the right, we have perhaps how people actually change, right? And I probably could have drawn that line a little bit more squiggly. It could have looked a little bit more crazy, but just for the optics of the graphic followed some sort of suit. Um, and so we know that people are less predictable than that, right? We don't always follow, we don't always fit in boxes to that extent. And I'm sure there's at least a couple people on the call saying, yeah, 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 we've got that covered because we actually have our, um, we've, we've delegated that to our, our HR director or our, uh, we've got these special consultants that focus on the psychological aspects. And actually, Erin, that's not even change management. That's actually transition management. And that's this other thing. And so I'm going to challenge that a little bit because I think this is sort of part of the problem is that we compartmentalize these things and we say, okay, we're going to control all the hard change stuff but the softer stuff, we'll delegate that somewhere else. We'll put it in a box kind of of the things that we can control and we'll almost have someone else deal with it. And I'm being a little bit exaggerating, but you kind of get the idea. We've all been working on change where that sort of uh, division in a sense happens. So I'm gonna suggest kind of an alternative way of looking at this as we, as we go through. So let's zoom back out to the pandemic again, right? So after the pandemic began in March, I was dialing into my undergraduate 
um, alma mater. We've got a couple people here from El Vernon College. And I listened to Dr. John Savagian talk about if pandemics happened before, why don't we remember them? And what he shared was very interesting, was that actually the first study of the impact of pandemics was in the late 1960s because there was a reluctance before that by historians to study anything that was not within our control. And I thought, wow, isn't this interesting? Pandemics have completely shaped our lives, but I don't really know about it. We didn't study it in school because it wasn't something that was well-researched. It wasn't something that was well understood. We instead preferred to focus on the things that are kind of within our, within our control. And so I really related that to work in organizations. When we think about traditional change management, that it also has really been focused on control. And you'll notice kind of the industrial age theme of the pictures that I have here on the right, because I think some of that comes from that industrial age mindset where doing things well and sort of a factory setting or whatever was motivated, it, you did, there was benefits of really tightly controlling it. And so that mindset kind of permeated. So I think back on my change management career, the very first large scale change management role that I fell into 15 years ago in a global investment bank. And I was studying some of the organic change theories. I'd actually studied them before, but they didn't really click in my mind until of course I was doing change in organizations. And I was talking to the, one of the leaders on our project and he said, oh, you know, you should talk to this guy. You know, he's studying, he's doing his MBA. He's studying some of that stuff too. You guys might enjoy talking. And I went to coffee with him and I was really excited about I think, complexity theory that somebody named here, a couple of other ones. And he said, oh yeah, I mean, I studied those organic change theories too, but organizations can't use them. So I just, I just kind of disregard them. I, I focus on the stuff that we can control. And my younger kind of more, I guess, naive and, and idealistic self was like, oh, but that's how people are actually changing. So shouldn't we, shouldn't we, try, to, shouldn't we try to understand it? And that didn't get said out loud very often, but it's definitely in the backdrop. It's kind of an assumption that I see that we make in change management that we need to really focus on what we can control. It's something we've been taught kind of in life and beyond kind of organizational life, you know, kind of the change the things you can change and the wisdom to know the difference sort of thing. And so we, we have that mindset as we go about change. Um, but I saw this again pop up more overtly. It, it's usually kind of quietly in the background. And I noticed right along the same time of this pandemic lecture from El Vernal College, my online change group, which is my group that I go to if I'm missing a template, if there's a gap in my technical knowledge around something that I'm delivering for a client, it's really a group that I can go to. So some of the smartest change management people that are out there. And so I was surprised when after the pandemic started a few weeks later, the moderator, one of the moderators posted, we will not allow any pandemic related posts as we cannot verify their accuracy. And I thought, gosh, here we are as change people, meaning we help change and we're in one of the biggest changes in history, probably in our lives. And we're just not gonna talk about it. We're gonna keep cha sharing change templates as if the world hadn't changed around us. And of course, eventually that caught up and you know, now nobody can really ignore the pandemic, but I think it kind of shows the mindset that we're coming from, that the word management almost gets emphasized more than the word change, that we're so closely and tightly trying to manage <laughs> that we don't kind of let ourselves go a little bit further and be perhaps more helpful by having insights into that which we can't control. So that brings me back to these two approaches to change, you know, certainly been around a long time, far before this, this current pandemic environment, but I think they shed light differently in light of what's happening. And that is um, me mechanistic change. So here on the left, you see mechanistic change. This is change that is led from the top down. Um, this is change that's managed through structure, meticulous implementation. Um, focus on how to get from A to B. So is this, is this something that is common for you in your organizations? I'd love, I'd love to hear from people. Um, do you, does this resonate? And then on the right, we have more of that organic change. So kind of like my visual that I showed before, change uh, coming from within and being something that comes from the people, uh, change that it taps into the hearts and minds of people. Um, that there's sort of this more continuous view of change and it's not something that has a to B or A to B to C to D, right? 
And so I'm suggesting here that perhaps looking a bit more at this right hand side will help us to be more effective change people and will help us get greater results uh, for our people. So my big question here is, what would happen if organizations let themselves think beyond what's in their control and would look instead at everything else? What would actually happen? And so that brings me to this model. This was essentially the, a very simplified version of the conceptual framework that was behind my research. And it looks at, you know, control is perhaps what's in that box. And these other things are around the outside. So individual dynamics, organizational dynamics, institutional dynamics. And of course, this is oversimplified in a way because some, we, some of these things we have control over and some we don't, but it's really to blow it open that that control piece fills up a much smaller part of the, the page than the stuff that we can't control. And so what do, I, what do I mean by this? So individual dynamics. So this is what individuals bring to the change. So the person that's going through a change in their organization what personal traits, characteristics, talents, what values do they have, what drives them, what kind of alignment do they have to organizational goals, what's their qualifications, how are they trained, were they say a, a qualified accountant, a graduate in a certain topic, how does that influence how they think, um, what kind of experience and knowledge do they have, and what are, the, what are their peers doing? I feel like the peers one sort of overlaps with these other categories, but I put it here because it's very personal. Individuals choose kind of which peers often that they, they listen to and, and have conversations with. Um, and so that's the individual box. Then we have the organizational box. And this is where we as organizations spend a lot of our time trying to figure out what we can, in a sense, control. Um, so there's the leadership. So a, a great new leader comes in and has a great vision. That's, that's part of, could be part of the organizational dynamics or kind of the unwritten part is maybe the leadership isn't that bought in, but we're doing it anyway. And we're kind of pretending we have all the buy-in, right? So leadership is a key piece. Rotation, mobility. So the, how does having a person move from the department they're in and maybe the profession that they were trained in and going and working somewhere else for a short time on a project? So the self-managed work teams idea fully embraces this where you basically are doing that all the time. For a lot of the rest of us, we're in organizations that have perhaps more regulation and we can't do quite as much of that uh, job rotation as, as informally, but we can give people these opportunities. Manager, you'll notice I put manager instead of management because I really do mean here the direct manager, the manager of the person. The person might have more than one manager, but it's really the person that uh, provides that guidance. And I'll, I'll get to why I what I mean by that in a bit. Also internal role models. So who do people look up to? Training programs, yes. We're aware that that's one of the, the factors that we sometimes try to tightly control. Uh, reputation of team and function, processes and systems, the organizational model, reward and recognition. If you have anything you wanna add to that, please feel free, but you get the idea. Okay, and then going over lastly to institutional dynamics, Sometimes people say, what's the difference between institutional and organizational? This is pretty much everything else. So technological advances, societal shifts. So as you're looking back at your own pandemic map, just thinking about, you may be thinking about things your organization did or things you did, but also what did the world do? How did the world impact you? Social, political, what about your national culture or your group culture that you belong to? How does that shape how you see this? Um, a marketing professional in India might see something different because of the cultural influences than a, a marketing professional in China versus one in, in the UK, right? So really thinking about how that shapes you. Government and regulation, we saw that really step up after, the, after 2008, people being much more aware of regulatory pressures. It went to being uh, a less talked about focus, frankly, in my experience in, in in, in organizations to being one that's really focused on, especially in the financial sector. And then profession, professional organizations. If I belong to a certain profession, how does that influence me? And yeah, and my industry expectations. So just thinking of the fact that this person is so much more complex and has all this influence. And if you look at your pandemic experience, how all of these influences have played into shaping kind of who you are and, and what, what you've done. So I say all this, but why does any of this matter, right? That's kind of the big question. 
And I would say it matters a lot because when we're talking about what we want to achieve in organizations, it can completely change how we get there. So instead of saying, oh, I'm not sure if I can use it, so I'm afraid of it, or I'm going to avoid it, it sounds messy, I'm going to just stick to my kind of, I don't know, change plan that's a little more linear and straightforward, uh, taking a little bit of risk and saying, how can I look at this differently? So what are the, the skill sets, mindsets, and identity shifts that happen when there's an organizational change going on? So I'm going to take some some general changes that are often happening when you have an organizational change here on the right, right? I often hear from clients, Erin, I need these people to be more proactive. I need them to be willing to find new ways to do things. Now that we're all working remotely, I can't spoon feed as much. I need people to be more independent and they need to be independent, but they need to work more collaboratively. And we need them to be more invested in understanding the business and org needs. And they need to do that proactively because we're again, at this point, not in person anymore. And a lot of times, whether it's whatever business it's in, there's a need to be able to tell the story. And often there's data in that story and there's more data than there used to be. So we need to be able to navigate that and being able to tell it, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. So if people are able to add in other things that they see focused on during times of change that they need people to, to shift in terms of their skill set, mindset and identity, please feel free to type it in. So oftentimes we target this stuff very directly. We'll say, okay, so what's the learning plan for the skills that are involved in this? Or what's the comms plan? But actually what sits behind that is something a little bit greater. And that's over here on the left, the things that are really driving whether or not they're going to even show up to try to do any of these things. Um, we need them to imagine, be able to imagine the impact that they could have with their client or their organization. They need to be bought in that this vision of change is even important, that it's not just a, oh, this is just something we're going to do during the pandemic, but then we're going to, we're going to lose interest or we're going to move on to the next thing. Uh, to understand how their role fits in with this change. So if they really think that this is something that they can, they can, can that they can get around, they'll, they'll, they'll be more likely to buy in to know and believe that the change is meaningful and meaningful to them and to be willing to use and learn the new tools and technology that are available. So really you can see the dynamics between how this is more than just a skill set. obviously it's a, and obviously many of you know this, that this is more of a mindset and an identity shift as well. So now we're here and I am gonna share with you a couple of examples of case studies that, that I can share in how this actually looked. The first one is from my research uh, sponsored by TC and the Adult Learning and Leadership Program. Um, and this is Pierre, obviously a pseudo name, but he's a finance person. And Pierre tells his story this way, and this came out of the, the interview, but I'll summarize at high level. He was always in firefighting mode. He was a trained accountant and he was always scrambling to meet client requests, trying to keep them happy, not anticipating their needs, not asking the right questions to clarify purpose, not really ever stepping back to think about how his work fit, fit into the bigger picture. And where he ended up, so I interviewed people, by the way, who were successful in transitioning to the future of what finance functions expect in, in organizations. And so this is what kind of came out of, of the work that he did himself is knowing he figured out where his team's work fit into the greater purpose. He began to proactively have um, information and analysis available to clients. So he didn't wait until the client called. He started to see the patterns and was able to have that stuff ready. He consulted with clients proactively about their business needs and their decisions. So he really started to get a seat at the table. And so he sees this as an absolute transformation in the value that he added. So, so what, right? So how did he do it? Did he go on a really great training class that the company provided? Uh, no, he went on some training classes, but that was not the highlight of where uh, he gives credit uh, to this. To this, he what what Pierre talks about a lot is the first and foremost the role that his direct manager played. His manager really saw a vision of how he could show up. This was a person who was very senior. He was responsible for a couple hundred people. And so he really spent his time getting Pierre to understand his role, to bring him in on things. There was a very vivid story that he shared about his direct manager and being in a room 
presenting to his senior most client who he used to be frankly sort of afraid of. And he said, here I am presenting to my boss and my boss's boss and I'm doing it. And I'm, I'm presenting to my client and my boss and my boss's boss are there and they could be doing it. They should be doing it, but they're not because they believe in me and I can do it. And he knew that if at any moment he had screwed up that they would step in and swoop in and save him, but that wasn't necessary. And so that type of risk taking that his manager helped engage him in really helped him. He also really had a, a real passion about belonging and doing something meaningful. And so for him, some of those organizational dynamics um, where the organization started to focus on the value of the finance function really motivated him. Somebody typed in here leading from the middle. Absolutely. You're definitely on the same page, uh, Fran, as I am with this, that there is a lot of opportunity here for leading from the middle. And um, institutional dynamics, there was also this shift at the same time. This was a few years ago. So there was shifts in the landscape of finance and really seeing where after the, the financial crash, where finance people, could, if having a seat at the table could help companies make better business decisions, more ethical business decisions, things like that. So he was really motivated by that set of different, uh, different, different inputs. So now let's go to somebody very different. This is Melissa. This is actually a client, again, a pseudo name. She's in marketing and she talked about how she used to be. And this was even before we were working together. She talks about how she would basically do whatever her clients asked her to do. She was busy all day long. She didn't have time to eat. She loved her work, but she basically admits that her work was producing collateral. A client would call and say, we need a brochure. And she would scramble to get the best brochure. She wouldn't step back and say, hmm, how does this fit in? What is their marketing strategy? How could I add greater value? She honestly measured herself by how much she was producing and how happy people were with the results. And her after uh, was that she, she had a new leader come in who had gotten her thinking and that's when I met her. So that leader got her thinking a little bit more about the purpose of marketing and how she might see herself differently. She reflected upon, she started as we worked together on the, the value and the digital marketing shift that she was seeing in the world around her. So she really tapped into some of those shifts that were happening and started following things outside of her organization that were even more, more innovative than what her organization was doing. She started this practice of really doing debate with self. So using her reflection as a tool to look at all of the different variables that were impacting how she showed up with the client. So she'd say, on the one hand, this client wants this urgently for tomorrow. On the other hand, if I were to give them this other thing, I think it would help them. So how do I figure out my entry point? And so she started to really loop in more partners and work across the organization. And that led to her proposing much more strategic solutions. And so she was in a place where she could balance doing some of the more tactical and pragmatic things with adding this greater value. And for her, there's certainly some similarities to Pierre, but for her, part of this was really being able to see from outside of the organization what this could look like, because she wasn't in the most innovative organization or industry. And even though her company was telling her that they wanted her to do this. She wasn't so sure that if she did it, it would be well received. And she really had to get over that issue of, I want the client to like me and figure out how can I present myself in a different way that's gonna add more value. And so she had to go through that shift herself. So again, you can see how a number of dynamics came forward. So when I share all this, I'm sure like my clients, you're asking these types of questions. You know, my clients will say, Erin, you know, this just seems so broad. I see that you had success with this, this small group or with this executive coaching that we set you up with, so thank you. But if we really wanna implement this more, bro more broadly, where do we start? And I am, by the way, first gonna share the questions with you and then I will attempt to answer them kind of collectively. But I wanna kind of name some of the questions. And if you wanna type into the chat any questions that you might have, I think that will that will help me as well to, to, cater, to cater to what you're you're thinking about. I also often hear this question of shouldn't we just start with the low hanging fruit? What's the easiest possible thing we can do? The lowest budget, you know, something that's again within our control and pick that. Um, so you know, I understand that mindset. How can I get senior leadership or the more metrics driven people to care? Does this mean we're not going to look at our our metrics and our the measurement that we've set up every quarter to to check in with how people are doing? Are we going to do this totally differently? Um, if I can't influence all these factors, how can I build them into the change? 
um, plan because it's a plan and I am supposed to be able to control it. I'm supposed to be able to report on red, amber, green. And how do I make the business case? So I think these are all very important questions that I will attempt to answer. So how do we actually do this? Um, there's sort of four things that I wanna focus on here. One is organization, two is leader and manager, and four is individual. Um, so first to start, the things that the organization can do is I think that the, really starting with the budget, reserving learning budget for mid-level managers is, is a very important thing. A lot of organizations actually spend the most of their money on the bottom and at the top of the organization. So on graduate trainees in their first couple of years and on C-suite. And we, we don't invest as much in mid-level. So I think that's a really important place to go. Also, how do we integrate the, the people shift um, into, into other work streams? So rather than saying people is something in a box, how do we, how do, we do it in other places? Um, what else influences people? So really thinking outside of other than the things that I can control like training, what else can I do? Um, and instead of control, really focusing on experimentation. So I'll give you a resource in a little bit by um, Dr. Marsik and Dr. Gebhardt from Adult Learning and Leadership, where they really have a model that focuses on experimentation with feedback loops. Um, and then finally, project-based experience and rotation, self-management, um, really giving people a chance to go and try things out on their own and try things out of the bucket that they're, that they're normally in. Then I'll go to manager. So for the manager, this is an opportunity for intelligent risk-taking. Um, I really see this, the example of Pierre, where he removed, his manager removed air cover and gave him that space. I think this is huge. This was a huge finding in my research that was very consistent. Um, putting yourself in the employee's shoes saying, who is this person in the change and how, how are these dynamics impacting them? And then translating your message for them, um, putting it aligning to the employee's purpose. Um, and then adapting, your leadership style. Style is one of the biggest tools I think that managers have to be able to adapt what you're doing for the needs of your team. And lastly, and then we'll go to questions. So I see here in the chat, we're gonna move to questions very shortly. Um, so the, lastly, the job, the role of job crafting. You may have heard this word, but it's where the individual, um, you can say, this isn't part of my current job, but I wanna sign up for something else, or I wanna, I wanna build something additional into my job that gives me more fulfillment signing up for a project outside of your role or business area, very, very similar. Um, also taking those intelligent risks. And if you don't have a manager that's giving you a good manager like Pierre had, finding that safety zone, how can I find a way to take risks but still get that support? And hopefully that's your manager, but if it's not, finding that in someone else. And then last but not least, really engaging in perspective taking. So thinking about why is my organization doing this? Why is my leader doing this? And how, how does this impact me? Trying to put yourself in the shoes of other stakeholders. Um, I think that can really help. So I am going, we are now going um, to questions. Um, and as you, as you ans answer these, I'd like you to think about what came up for you in your pandemic experience. And maybe that uh, triggers a, a question that you, wanna, that you wanna ask. Okay, so you're hopefully submitting questions through the, through the Q and A. Um, and obviously we do offer services related to all these things. Our real belief is that organizations have to lead and drive it. And so our role is one of, is one of partner. Okay. So should we turn it over for questions, Elisa? Yes, I think so. But before we go to questions, I first want to say thank you so much for this presentation. And everyone, if you have questions for Erin, please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A pane, which is located at the bottom of your screen. So Erin, the first question we have is, how do you think of change across organizations that are members of ecosystems? For example, across the supply or the value chain or the dynamics of change across different organizations? Bottom up may mean among CEOs, unless there's a clear designated like top dog, so to speak. Okay. So I like the line of thinking. So what's the, I, I don't know what my, what my answer would be. I mean, that's certainly a person that's thinking along those lines is definitely appreciating these interdependent, you know, these interdependent dynamics at a deep, as a, at a deep level and acknowledging that it's not just what my company is doing and how that impacts people, but a much more multi-dimensional view. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's great. I think that's that's a dissertation that somebody can do. 
So if we have any current students in the all program, there's a future dissertation um, topic for someone. So the next question I have, Erin, so earlier you were talking about the individual, the organizational and the institutional dynamics. And in the conceptual framework, you focused on those three specifically. How do you think society dynamics fit into the shift or the organizational change? Yeah, well, they're in, you know, to make the slide clean, they fit in the institutional bucket. So they're definitely a part of it. And if, I, yeah, I think they interplay. I think that's the point is that these all interact dynamically. Um, to answer that, I would, my, my dissertation sponsor is Victoria Marsick, and I believe she might be here. Um, but she, in her book with Martha Gephardt, um, Strategic Organizational Tur Learning, talk about how these, inter these interdependent dynamics show up differently in different organizations. So you can't just say, oh, this is how it is. You have to look at, it might impact your organization differently than another one in the same industry, because there's, there's other different underlying dynamics at play. So I think it's really, the main thing here is that this is not a copy paste. It's rather a way to look at this. And when you look at it in this way, you are letting a lot of things come in. It's a bit daunting because it means you are losing some control, but it gives you access in a sense to look at this broader landscape. And then the work is really in figuring out what that looks like for your, um, your organization. Perfect, thank you so much. So our next question is, as a change manager, how do we transition from hand-holding people through, through the chain to making them internalize and display these behaviors that will reflect the organizational change? Yeah, I mean, that's a big question. I, if that person is internal in their organization, I certainly appreciate that because I felt like I got so, more, so much more freedom once I was external to, the, to say the same things that I'd been saying as an internal person. So you do get more creative license, people will sort of trust you more because you're coming from that external per perspective. When you're internal, it's tough because I, I remember I would, I would kind of diagnose a problem or a bigger, more complex way of looking at it. And by the end of the meeting, it would be, okay, Aaron, can you take that away and come up with a one pager of how we're gonna solve it? And I'm like, well, I wasn't, that wasn't really what I was thinking. I wanted us to all start thinking a certain way. But so, yeah, I think it's really about change management versus say coaching. I look at how when the pandemic started, how the executive coaching community sort of responded the opposite of the example I gave, which was, we don't know how we can help yet. So we're gonna, we're gonna just schedule calls. So Dr. Maltbia at, in the Adult Learning and Leadership Program, the, you know, that's the, the Columbia Coaching Network, he would just host these Zoom calls on Friday nights and you could join and talk about how that impacted you. So, and you know, how we wanna show up. So it was sort of the opposite of, instead of saying, let's try to control this, let's look at what's possible. And so I think really merging that more coaching mindset with, the change mindset is that can be really beneficial, but yeah, it's easier said than done. This is a long, we're on, it's a it's a process to be on rather than something to sort of implement today. Completely agree. And so earlier we kind of talked about you know control and how I mean we as human beings just love having that sense of control. And early reference, I mean, not a lot of people were doing research about the pandemic because there was no control over it. So we have a couple of questions regarding about control. So as an individual, how do, can we navigate change when your manager or senior leadership are very controlling and resistant to change? Yeah, I mean, again, it's easier said than done, but I think it's having somebody who is part of the leadership of this. And perhaps in an ideal world, this is your CHRO, if you have one and HR really has a seat at the table, that they're having that voice because this isn't a presentation that the change people can come and do once a month or once in a while. It's more of an ongoing dialogue. And so the more that they can bring those leaders into that dynamic. I mean, when I'm trying to influence senior leaders, I often talk about the relationship to strategy development. If you look at any strategy development model, new product development, experimentation is such a huge part of the, the model. But yet when it comes to changing lots of people in organizations, we reduce experimentation to be a much smaller piece. So trying to kind of it, you know depend on the person, but I would try to build on places where they're being innovative and being strategic and then kind of apply it to show them that that applies to the change piece. And ideally you have somebody in the organization at a senior level like a CHRO or one of the business leaders themselves that has that mindset. So kind of in that same vein, if you're an employee who uh, doesn't agree with the organizational change or the vision of a leader, how do you navigate this like by voicing your concerns or thoughts on the change, et cetera? 
Yeah, so, I mean, for one thing, we don't all have to agree. I think that's, you know, the, the left-hand side of the change, the change list that I, that I laid out makes it look like it's all neat little boxes, but there's definitely a place and even great value from people who, you know, where people will speak up about something different. I think it's about choosing your battles is influencing, is getting this leader to see your point of view going to be valuable and important. If you have an open culture, by all means, hopefully they value it. If it's less so, you might sort of choose and look at it kind of putting yourself in their shoes and saying, what do, what do I need him or her to understand? Why is that important to me? If I was coaching that person, we'd have conversations around, can I get some of that need met, met elsewhere? So if my manager is leading me in a way that I don't agree, can I reach out to another role model? All right, thank you so much. So we have another question. How to tackle the feel of the fear of failure that people struggle with while during these like shiftings of, of organizational change shifts. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's all, it's all human nature. We have those instincts for a reason. You know, you think of the classic change curve of when we're losing something, we feel that sense of loss. So sort of being able to step out of yourself and seeing that and, and knowing that is okay. Um, it's also this idea that we're changing all the time. So I saw, I think it was Thomas type in here, agility. It's this idea of almost thinking of what you're doing as a muscle that's going to get used time and time again. It's not like you're just going to change this one time. I think it's interesting. We sometimes present, say, future of work 2021 as if it's a brand new thing, but it's all built upon things that have been going on for, for a couple decades. We've been changing organizations for a long time and there's been different iterations. So by using that muscle, you're, there's an output right now about a, a, sh a shift you need to make, but you're using that muscle and it means you're gonna be able to do it better the next time. So kind of embracing it and accepting it as a, a healthy part of life. Obviously, if it's throwing you to a place where you, you don't feel like you can function, maybe the stretch is too much for you, um, you wanna negotiate, a slower transition or something like that. But but yeah, in general, I think it's it's a healthy thing to be going through these things. And it, it, it is the world, right? It's not, no one's job is gonna stay the same in, in this era. Definitely. I mean, with everything that's been going on, every organization is kind of changing bits and pieces of what, you know, the normal day-to-day -day looks like to kind of adapt to what our situation yeah. is. So I think we'll do one last question before we wrap up. Um, so the question is, you know, with boards, either corporate or nonprofit, they're always looking for, you know, the push for growth, every the, looking to see how we can grow our numbers, our funding, et cetera, et cetera. And so they want to look at change management initiatives, but they're not patient. Sometimes they're not that patient. And as you were mentioning, you know, change just it, it takes time so what advice do you have to you know kind of relay back to the board about you know the the patience and the steps it takes to to have this type of growth that they're looking for yeah well i think it is a role of essentially informally contracting with them i don't mean assign contracts but i mean talk with, with them about what you're planning explaining that experimentation is a big part of of what's happening maybe calling the things that you're doing experiments, you know, kind of lessening the expectation of the immediate kind of results and doing storytelling throughout. So I truly believe in most cases, if you give people space to do stuff and you give them the resources to do stuff, they will do it. I, I'm gonna actually, if I can go to my next page, the, the first hand, the first recommended uh, book or for further kind of reading is the Change Handbook. Was It's just a very simple, it's a huge handbook, but it's very simple in that it has, it's basically interventions that you can do. And it gets you to think about a way that you might have. So one of them is called future search. A lot of people are probably familiar with open space. So these are different ways of sort of setting up a discussion so that you get people engaged. If you enter it in a classic board meeting, they're not gonna be as receptive as if, as if you can convince them, let's schedule a separate hour or 90 minutes where we do it a whole different way. Different things are gonna come out and that way they can get, I think, involved, invested in it. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Erin. And I know we didn't get to get everyone's questions, so I'm so sorry. So Erin has, you know, generously provided her contact information. So if we didn't get to your question or you have any burning questions for Erin about change management, please feel free to give her a call or email her. Yes, um, I'd love to, love to chat about any of it with anyone who, who would like to. 
Fantastic. And Erin, just thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about organizational change management um, and just the various things that we need to think about during this topic. Um, everyone, thank you so much again for joining us today. Please stay tuned to our emails and our social media channels for details on future events. We hope to see you at future TC alumni events. And until then, thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful day. And happy holidays, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.